Peace. My name is Ju Salim, and the book that I'm going to be reading today is From the Bottom of the Heap by Robert Hillary King. Um, part of the reason I've chosen this is, uh, one is I don't have many story books. I have lots of books, but not many story books. The other reason is because I got to meet Robert and what was, what is known as the Angola Three, who were a group of black men who were in the Angola prison, which is a very infamous prison because it was um, for its basically its cruelty. You know, it's it's cruel and unusual punishment of its prisoners and and particularly surprise surprise black prisoners. And the fact that I got to meet him and and several of the other Panthers and got this book from them directly, bought a couple of copies, I have a, a signed copy, and he, you know, in prison for a crime he didn't commit, um, served over uh, 29 years. Um, I'm going to read chapter 12, which is way before he gets in prison that time, because as you, when you read it, you realize these kind of things happen several, several times through his life. Um, chapter 12. Sitting on the bus that Tuesday night, heading back to New Orleans, my mind flashed back over the events of the past month, and I didn't like what I saw. I had arrived in Chicago on a freight train with the hope of making it, and I was now returning empty-handed on a Greyhound bus, defeated, ashamed, and a little humiliated. Chicago had shown me just how frail and small I was. I had a lot of learning and growing up to do. I was like the frog in the well who jumped out one day and saw that the world was much vaster than he had thought. Looking up, awed and confused, he croaked himself to death. Well, I hadn't croaked myself to death, but I was one horse frog. <laughs> On the other hand, I rationalise, had not I gained something in defeat? Isn't there also a victory of sorts? Now I knew more about the world outside the South. Before falling asleep, I made a solemn promise to myself. I promised to one day return to Chicago. And this time, I vowed it would be different. To my surprise, no one ridiculed me for my failure. As a matter of fact, I was praised by a mule. Houston and others, who saw my adventure as something to be proud and not ashamed of. That is, all but Mama. She said, boy, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. What are you trying to do? Worry me to death? You leave home, don't tell nobody where you're going. I get a call, you weigh in Chicago. I hope you learned your lesson. About three days after returning, I began experiencing excruciating pain in the balls of my feet. They felt as if someone were placing heated irons to them, setting them afire. I couldn't stand or walk without the aid of crutches, which our next door neighbour loaned to me when she learned of my predicament. And the only part of my feet that could come into contact with the floor or anything else were my heels. Mama diagnosed my case. She said my feet were frostbitten and brought me to the hospital. After standing in line for what seemed like hours on my neighbor's crutches, we finally reached the nurse's desk. She bore a sour attitude and had a face to match it. It seemed she had won first prize at a sneering contest and was trying to stay in first place. Or maybe she was a devout member of the Daughters of the American Revolution. Da. She sneered across the desk and asked, what's wrong with you? This was addressed to Mama who said, there ain't nothing wrong with me. My son has prospering feet. I then went on to explain what happened. My trip to Chicago, etc. When I finished, she said, well, I am sorry, but the doctors can't do anything for frostbite. There is no cure. After that, she dismissed us by saying, next person, please, in an exasperated manner. Mama, perhaps not realizing she could have demanded treatment, turned, me following, and left the charity hospital. Three days later, the pain hadn't yet let up, but I had begun to notice that the pain was less intense when I kept my feet away from heat 
and from this an idea took shape. Since heat increased the pain, cold would decrease it. I put my idea to test with the tub filled with ice cubes and water. I placed my feet therein and I felt the soothing effects. Wanting to be sure, I pressed the balls of my feet to the tub's bottom. No pain whatsoever. Thinking I had found a cure, I stepped out of the tub and began jumping and shouting, but my joy was short-lived. For after being out of the cold water for about 15 minutes, my feet went back to their normal temperature and the red-hot pain was back. Well, so much for the cold water remedy, I thought. But while the ice water didn't make my feet well, it gave me a reprieve from constant pain. <clears throat> But Mama was determined to make my feet well. She came back one day and said, Junior, I can't find nothing in the drugstore to help you. I talked to the drugstore man and told him what he was doing to keep out of pain. And he told me to tell you to stop putting them in that water if you don't want to lose your feet. I guess I must have resigned myself to losing my feet because I had no intention whatsoever of giving up my remedy, even if it was temporary. Unable to find anything at the pharmacy for frostbite, Mama resorted to a cure of her own. She went to the store and bought some rutabaga, which are like big turnips in bunches. She sliced and dry roasted them, then placed them into thin linen strips and wrapped them around my feet while still scorching hot. She told me that it was an old folks remedy and she had no doubt that it would draw out the frost. <laughs> My belief in Mama and her remedy was the only thing that forced me to endure the intense pain I felt using that method. I dressed my feet in linen and rutabaga three times daily. The fourth day I was able to stand on them without feeling pain. Less than two weeks later, I was walking as good as new. Ten months had passed since I'd returned from Donaldsonville and I had yet to see my sister, Mary. I had begun to wonder about her. Then one night she knocked on the door. I opened it. She was there, holding her abdomen, moaning a little. She asked for Mama, her voice strained. Mama, hearing her name, came into the room and exclaimed, Child, what in the world is wrong with you? Mary didn't answer, just continued holding her abdomen. Mama's next words were, Girl, is you pregnant? Mary didn't show any signs of pregnancy at all but Mama was already getting dressed. When she finished, she said, Come on, Junior, we have to go to the hospital. Mary is experiencing labour pains. At the hospital, Mary was rushed to the emergency section. Mama with her. I sat in the waiting section. A few hours later, I learned that Mary had indeed been pregnant and had given birth to a stillborn. The whole process, from the time of Mary's knock upon the door to her delivery, had taken less than four hours and on the 13th hour Mary left again going back to when she had came. During the early months of 1958 I worked at odd jobs nothing permanent. Mama worked at odd jobs herself. She had ceased working for Aunt Clem and had begun working for her other sister Aunt Alma who also owned a bar and restaurant during this period, the only businesses people of African descent were allowed to run were barbershops, small groceries, funeral parlours, bar rooms and churches, the latter three in abundance. Mama worked part-time for Aunt Alma and also did housework for the white lady who owned the grocery store where she had established credit. I had a secret yearning to retire Mama from her meagre jobs where she earned meagre earnings and had nothing to show for her labours but the signs of weariness written on her face and body. But as things turned out, I was left with an unfilled yearning for all time. So this is the book. Uh, as a possible activity, it would be good to for people to possibly um, find out about the prison systems where they are. I mean, this is the US, uh, Louisiana, uh, Angola prison. But we have prisons here, some of them. 
better than others. Some of them um, have more prisoners than others. And it's good to just be able to find out what's going on and even write write to a prisoner because that could be a lifeline. Um, it's something I've done in the past and I've been meaning to do again myself. So I'm saying that as much to myself as to the, the listener. Thank you for listening. You can watch and listen to more stories in the 100 Stories Deep series if you subscribe using the link below. Thanks and goodbye. Peace.